Just to be sure though, I am going to do one more example here where we're going to look at how we can handle the t-test in terms of critical regions. And I'll say that working for the t-test in terms of critical regions is essentially the same as with the z-test, albeit with some t-test flavoring added in for good measure. Here we have our basic steps, wherein we check our conditions, make sure that those are satisfied. Again, they almost always are. Then we state our hypotheses and claim, find the level of significance, then our degrees of freedom and critical values, then use those to define our rejection region or regions for that matter, find our test statistic to compare them to, make our decision, and then interpret what we're working with. So, like I said, very, very similar steps to the z-test, but there's that little addendum there in terms of the fact that our test statistic is now using a t-value, and because we're using a t-value, we need to identify the degrees of freedom along the way, but as far as mathematical complexity, it's a very, very similar. So for this example, we have that an industrial water company claims the mean pH level in a nearby river is 6.8. And we suppose that you randomly select 39 samples from the river that have a mean of 6.7 and a standard deviation of 0.35, where what we want to do here is determine whether that information is enough to reject the company's claim at alpha equals 5%. Again, that value alpha equals 5% is very much a traditional value we work with. I swear there are other ones, but 5% is the most common that we'll see. Anyway, for this, we can start with our first couple of steps. Again, here, if we want to check our conditions, I'm not going to write that down, but we would make sure that we have enough information. Here, we have 39 things in our sample. That's good enough. And combined with our S value of 0.35, we know we're going to be working with a t-test. From there, in terms of our hypotheses and our claim, we have the null and alternative like usual, but here we have one of those odd values where we are claiming that the mean mu is 6.8, or appropriately, the company is claiming that it's 6.8. So, our claim lands in the null hypothesis. And we always do build this around the claim. At least I think that's the easiest way to do it, where you get the claim and then you find its complement to get whether it's the alternative or null, the other one. Which means that because our claim is equality, our alternative hypothesis here will be anything else. That is, that our mean is not 6.8. From there, we want to identify our level of significance alpha, where, as always, that's our given value, representing the desire we have to be reasonable here, 5%. Then we can talk about our degrees of freedom and critical values. Our degrees of freedom, still nothing too special to get those. It's just one minus the sample size. Here we have 39 things, so we can be free, as it were, with 38 of them. And then to find our critical values, depending on how we want to think about this, we can either use the table or the calculator. I prefer the calculator, but that's, I think, uh, a few words you've heard me say a few times at this point. But anyway, however we want to handle this, we just have to be careful with the fact that our critical values here will come from both tails. So we are getting positive and negative values, but if you use the calculator, that would be something like inverse t at 0.975 and 38 degrees of freedom for an approximate pair of plus and minus 2.024. Which means that if you want to think about our rejection regions, you want to think about what this distribution looks like in terms of what we want, our regions are going to be at the ends. That is, we either want things below negative 2.024, if we're looking to reject, or above positive 2.024. And then from there, we can talk about our t-value, that is our test statistic here, where we're going to use that same formula that we have in the others. 
that's going to be 6.7 minus 6.8 over s, 0.35, divided by the square root of n, where here n is 39. So you run that, and you'll get that t is approximately negative 1.784. So, looking at that distribution, you might have noticed it already, I put that picture up, but you should see that this value, negative 1.784, is bigger than the lower value, that is, it's bigger than negative 2.024, but it is also less than positive 2.024, which means this value is in the middle. And whenever we have a two-tailed test, that's kind of the clearest indicator that it does not get rejected because you know, seeing it's in the middle is a little bit less subtle than like, is it big for a small one or is it small for a big one? No, we just look and see whether it gets stuck in between them. So because it is between those two values, because our test statistic is between, it is in the non-critical or non-rejection, depending on how you want to call that, region. So. we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That is, if you want to think about this in terms of our conclusion, our interpretation, we could say that there is not enough evidence to reject the claim that the mean pH level is 6.8 for alpha equals 5%. Now, when it comes to rejecting a claim directly in this way, there is a little bit of leeway in terms of how you want to read that. Sometimes you can also read that as saying there is evidence to support the claim, but it's, it's a little murkier with this sort of distinction there. More often when we're making that type of statement, it's dependent on our alternative being the claim. But just be careful about what you're looking for there. Where I will say that, as always, we can always do this stuff in the calculator as well using that t-test computation, where for this, you will again notice that you get the t-value as well as the p-value. So even if you want to do a critical value rejection region type of test with this problem, it's still a good idea to check the p-value you get, because sometimes it can be subtle to tell whether or not the test statistic falls into the rejection region but usually it's pretty easy to tell if the p-value is too big or too small if you just compare it directly to alpha. But anyway, it's really a matter of what you get most comfortable with and what a specific exercise as you're practicing with this is asking for. And this now is actually it for our section beyond some calculator stuff. Um, next week, we're gonna keep moving on with this material into 7.4, where we will be looking at how to do these types of computations in the context of proportions and a special version of the z-test. I'll see you then.